I wanted to take this opportunity to give you all an idea of um, how the ARM architecture port we did works and how the code looks different from the x86 stuff you might be used to. So um, let's start out by a quick look at what ARM actually is. Uh, I'm sure most of you know this, but just to recap, it's a different ISA from x86. It uh, uses 32-bit data, data and address words and 32-bit fixed width instructions too. Although they later changed that and introduced another mode, which includes both 16 and 32 bit wide instructions to um, get the code more compact and achieve better uh, eye catch usage, uh, which is actually the mode that we use in Core Boot. Um, it's used on a lot of mobile devices. Uh, we've been using it on a bunch of Chromebooks now. And one of the interesting differences about ARM is that the company ARM doesn't actually sell any silicon. They just design uh, chip components and then license those out to actual silicon vendors to put them on their chips in addition to a bunch of other parts. And so a usual ARM system isn't just uh, a die containing processors, but it's a whole what they call system on chip, which includes a whole bunch of uh, integrated peripherals like spy controllers, USB controllers, I2C controllers, and stuff like that, all in the same chip. and all of the parts that are not the main CPU core and uh, cache infrastructure are usually uh, custom to the specific SOC and they're not made from ARM itself. So there's not a lot of standardization there. There's also now a 64-bit uh, evolution of ARM called ARM64 or sometimes ARCH64, um, which looks pretty much the same, uh, has 32-bit fixed with instructions again. They kicked out thumb mode and uh, there are a few special parts about that I'll get to later. Um, let's have a closer look at what makes this different from x86 in particular in the firmware point of view. Uh, the first thing we notice is that um, we do not have a memory map boot medium like on x86. Um, instead, so A, we can't just access a memory address and get uh, data from SPY back that way. We can also not put our instruction vector there and execute in place from SPY. Instead, we have usually some on-chip SRAM, and the SOC just loads the first part of our firmware into SRAM, jumps to there, and from then on, we're on our own. So if we want to load up any future parts, uh, like the, the next stage of core boot, we have to write our own SPY driver, have to bring up all the clocks and stuff to make the SPY controller work and then manually load that into some other part of SRAM and jump there. Um, the nice part about that is we also don't have to deal with any of the cache SRAM weirdness that S S6 devices usually have. The SRAM that we do have stays available for the whole time. So even after we initialize DRAM, we can keep our stack there. We don't have to do any weird jump to tear down the environment we have been in before. Um, one of the few things that are more complicated on ARM than on x86 is caching. We do not have simple MTRRs or something like that to just mark a whole region as cacheable. We always need to bring up the full paging system to set memory attributes for anything. So usually one of the first things we do in the boot block after we've got control is build a page table and uh, initialize caching that way so that we can execute faster. Also, DMA peripherals on ARM usually don't cache snoop the way they do on x86. So on x86, when you hand a transfer buffer to like a USB controller, for example, it will just work and you don't have to think about any um, of the weird consequences of the cache architecture there. On ARM, you actually have to make sure that you don't have um, that buffer in the cache at the point where the controller accesses it and then um, later make sure you read it back from memory because there's no uh, direct connection to the cache. So um, since we all know cache management is one of the hardest parts um, in uh, doing system software, uh, we actually usually try to avoid that completely by uh, allocating uncached buffers. Um, this usually only happens in the payload with the USB stack there and uh, some of the storage stacks. So we have a separate allocator actually in the payload with functions called DMA malloc or DMA memeline, where we can get uncached buffers and use those for uh, those DMA devices. In core boot, it usually doesn't come up because most of the devices we use just can just use PIO instead. Um, 
We also don't have a peripheral enumeration system in the same way we usually do on x86. So while some ARM SOCs do have PCI uh, controllers, you usually don't use them much because most of the stuff you need is already on the SOC and it's memory mapped in some platform specific way. So we can't go through and enumerate all the stuff we have on boot. We usually need to hard code and know what we have beforehand. We also don't have SPD for the memory. So uh, if we want to bring up memory, we need to know exactly what kind of chip we have through some other channel. Um, some of the other things I also feel are way more explicitly software controlled than on an x86 system. For example, the clock tree is usually needs to completely manually be controlled with every single device and PLL in there. I'll get into a few more details for that later. One of the nicer things on the other end is that we don't usually need runtime firmware components. So we just boot the system, hand off to the OS, and then we are gone. If the OS wants to suspend or resume, that's all done in the kernel itself. The, the firmware is completely gone at that point. At least that was the happy idealized world we lived in until a while ago when ARM64 became equivalent because they changed the game again. Now we do need runtime firmware again. Um, let's have a quick look at what's our current status and core boot for ARM systems. These are all the SOCs we support. We started with the um, Samsung ones when we first did the port. Uh, then the Tegra T124, I think, uh, got the distinction of being the first ARM SOC that was commercially sold with core boot right in the product. Um, and since then, we've uh, brought up a few others. Uh, from the ones with the bullet points, I know that they're well supported and booting. Uh, the few ones down there are also in the repository, but I'm not quite sure what their current status is. I think it's, uh, some of them have been started and maybe not finished. Uh, and some of them are kind of old, and I think they might have uh, been broken by now. We also used to have QEMU ports for both uh, ARM32 and ARM64, but I'm not quite sure if they're still working at this point. Um, for the rest of the talk, I want to give you a quick uh, run, essentially, through the boot process of one of those SOCs. Um, as an example, I picked the RK3288 rock chip, both because I'm very familiar with it and also because it's a very simple chip. So it doesn't have a lot of the weird kinks and quirks that some of those others have. Um, before we can get into the code there, one thing I want to demonstrate is, um, so we do have this problem that we run an SRAM, and we often have only a very small amount. On the 3288, it's especially tight because we only have 100K. And we need to fit a whole lot of things in there. So when we started doing uh, core boot on ARM, we just usually had a bunch of kconfig uh, variables deciding where does our boot block live, where do our page tables live, and so on, which really got unmanageable after a point because if you do that with a boot block and then you add a few more functions and it grows in size, it might grow into something else. Like it might grow into the space where you want to have your page tables and then you accidentally end up overwriting stuff at one time and get really weird bugs without having a good way to figure them out. So we came up with this, this system of statically allocating all the SRAM sections and having assertions to make sure that none of them overlap. So every ARM SOC has uh, this file in the SOC directory somewhere, um, which is actually a linker script, although it doesn't look like it, because we really heavily lose uh, C preprocessor macros to both this kind of declarative language of um, just describing the memory layout, and then that will be converted into uh, linker script statements that both provide you with symbols that you can access from C to get those start and end addresses for each of these regions, and also throw a whole bunch of linker assertions in there, that, which make sure that uh, A, none of these regions can overlap. So if I changed, um, like if I changed the size of this page table buffer TTB to be 20K, then I would get a, run, a compile time assertion that it overlaps this next section. Um, and for the stages, like the boot block and the RAM stage, uh, RAM stage over there, if the code I want to link into there ends up being larger than the section allows for, then I'll also get it to compile time assertion. So um, this really allowed us to uh, squeeze our stuff into these really tight SRAM sections without uh, running into bugs every few uh, changes. So um, let's take a look at how our code looks like right when we start booting. So 
usually ARM chips boot out of a mass form, then they hand off to core boot, uh, core boot's boot block after they loaded it into SVM. So the first thing we execute is a bunch of assembly. But as you can see, it's really simple. Um, we set some kind of system register, jump into thumb mode, initialize our caches, set up our stack pointer, and then we're essentially good to go. So we don't have to do any, uh, you know, jumping to protected mode, setting up descriptor tables, and that that whole length of uh, code that you have to do in X86 to get to a C environment. And um, then the rest of what the boot block needs to do is essentially make sure we can load the ROM stage. So um, in the main uh, like high level boot block function, we essentially call a bunch of hooks. Um, the point of the first two, the early ones, is really just to make sure that uh, the UART works so that we can run console in it and start getting output. Then the other two ones are supposed to make sure that the one ROM stage part works, which means bringing up the spy controller, bringing up all the clocks required for it and so on. So let's have a look at how this looks for the 3288 in particular. The first thing that runs here is the boot block mainboard in it over there, uh, mainboard early in it, sorry. And uh, the only thing we need to do on this chip is uh, make sure that the UART pins are maxed to the UART special function. So one of the things you have on many ARM SOCs is that all their pins can be maxed between different controllers. So you can make the same pin be either a, a part of the spy controller or the L2C controller or just be a GPAO or something like that. So usually you have to do some kind of register write like that one to assign it to one of these functions before you use it. After that, we can like we go back into the main function call console in it. Then we come back here. Um, first thing we do is set up our clocks, which I'll get into in a minute. And after that, we start setting up paging because, as I said, we need paging to do caching. So uh, the decache and the enable part will also enable caching and make us run faster from then on. You can see here that we are using these uh, linker script labels that are assigned by the mem layout part. So the, the SVM label over here and the SVM size are both provided by that mem layout. And if you change it in there, it will automatically change in here. Um, those are the SOC generic parts, meaning um, that's probably what we need on every single board that uses this SOC. The rest of the stuff. Um, that's specific to the board we have should go in the main board parts, obviously, which in this case is everything uh, concerning the power solution. So on an ARM chip, you usually have a secondary power management I see somewhere on the board and you usually have to manually increase the uh, voltage and software whenever you want to raise your CPU frequency or something like that. So that would be what we're doing here. We're initializing the IQC controller to that chip. Then we're um, raising the power rail to be able to bump our CPU to the highest frequency and continue booting faster from then on. Then we initialize the spy bus and we're ready to go through the bomb stage. Um, one last thing I want to get into is the clock part, which is, I think, a lot more complicated than on x86. Um, this is just a very tiny uh, excerpt of the full, like, four or five page long clock tree of this chip. Just want to give you a general idea that you usually have a bunch of PLLs at the top, which all need to be configured to a certain frequency. And then they can be maxed. Uh, then, then you have a bunch of consumers, which can usually be maxed to several, but not all of those PLLs. And they all have their own divisor. Sometimes you have subordinate clocks like these two, which also get maxed to different PLLs of their own divisors. And then once again, there's multiple consumers below that. So you have a pretty complicated tree of uh, devices and have to be really careful that the frequencies you end up with for an individual device are the ones that you want. So um, usually what we've been trying to do is make sure we only have a, like we keep as much of this constant and compile, compile time constant as we can. We um, define a bunch of header constants to for each of these PLLs and subordinate clocks. And then we make sure that when we do uh, program those devices, we calculate them from those constants. So if for example, I need to change one of the PLL frequencies. I can make sure that if the, all the devices are calculated like that, they will all change accordingly and I won't get any weird uh, inconsistencies in that code. And usually we, we set up all the uh, PLLs and intermediate clocks right at the beginning, so we have them. And after that, we have individual functions to set up every device once we need it, like the spy controller right here. A lot of the other things would be initialized later, like in the uh, web stage. 
So once we get this, we're off to booting. Uh, just getting back a bit to the differences from booting in x86 worm stage in this case. Um, as I said, the boot block actually got loaded by the SOC's masked worm itself. So it's not in CBFS, and it usually needs some kind of magic wrapper so that the SOC masked worm can recognize it. We have that somewhere in the uh, SOC make file hidden usually. Um, after that, the, the boot block will load the worm stage, and all we need to do is make sure the spy transfer function essentially works, or the rest is common code that handles that. Um, since we, since a lot of the CVFS functions we have are still written with x86 in mind and think they can just map uh, spy memory to a pointer, we need some kind of, uh, we, we need a little SOM area to uh, emulate that functionality by just loading stuff into there essentially. Um, we also can't use LZMA for all the early stages because LZMA requires a big 16K scratch pad. It also requires you to have some space to first load the compressed buffer to before you can uncompress it to where you actually want it. And all of that probably doesn't fit into SOM. So we switched to a different compression algorithm for these and use LZ4, which has the nice advantages of both being uh, having no internal memory overhead when decompressing and also being able to decompress in place, meaning we can just load our compressed stage to the end of the ROM stage region where we want to execute it. And then we can start decompressing from the start of that compressed buffer to the start of the uncompressed buffer, and it will override itself without uh, requiring any more space anywhere. So after this, we are off to 101 ROM stage. Like on x86, the main point of the ROM stage is really only to bring up memory. Um, sometimes we need to do a few things before that, like uh, waste some voltage rail to make sure our memory is actually um, running with enough power to run the frequency we are running it at, um, or do some other things that need to be done really early, like initialize the uh, thermal control, um, thermal shutdown, something like that. Um, so the main thing is the SDRAM in a function over there. This is just a normal function call onto other open source core boot code. There's no FSP, no, no memory reference code in these systems. Usually it's all open source. Um, we need to figure out where to get the parameters to tell us, like, which memory chip we're actually running at, which I'll get to in a minute. And once we are done with that, we can just change our page tables to mark all the memory we just initialized as runnable, initialize the BMEM, and that's pretty much it for the ROM stage. Um, let's drill down to what that guest get a DRAM config over there means. Um, as I said, we don't have any SPD, and we usually want a, a multi source RAM chips on a single board. So we need to know which kind of RAM chip we are actually initializing here. And the solution we use for that is uh, essentially we just have a bunch of files like the one over there having a huge struct initializer and then we include all of them into an array and just index that with something that we have strapped to a few uh, GPA pins on the SOC. So um, we can use the same firmware for a bunch of different main boards using different RAM chips. They're just strapped differently and then it will pick at one time the right uh, memory configuration to pass to the SUM code. Um, that's essentially our poor man's SPD version. Um, so once we've done all that, we're off to boot the RAM stage. Um, on x86, as you may know, the RAM stage runs this whole uh, boot state machine, which goes through every single PCI device and uh, runs a bunch of callbacks to read resources, initialize, and so on. Um, this isn't really useful for us in ARM since we don't have this, these enumerable peripherals usually. So we still run the same state machine, but we kind of neuter it by only using the SOC and mainboard init callbacks usually, and then we just hard code everything we need there. In the mainboard case, that's usually all the devices that we think our payload needs, which uh, we haven't initialized yet, like USB, uh, MMC, something like that. Um, for the SOC part, um, I don't know, it sometimes doesn't really matter where you put it. Um, we do use the core boot resource management system, so we need to uh, initialize our RAM resource so our memory tables look okay after that. But usually that's the only resource we have because we don't have a, a PCI hole in the address space or something like that, so um, that's usually all we need in the memory table. Um, we also, if we do want to use display uh, graphics output in the payload, we'd initialize it here. 
once again, this is just a normal function call. Usually it's not, uh, th there's no such thing as a VGA uh, video bias or something like that. So all of this is open source code that's just called straight in core boot. Um, that's pretty much it for booting. Uh, so now we could ask, where do we want to go from here? As you may know, uh, Chrome OS uses its own payload. So we haven't really focused much on bringing ARM support to any of the other payloads generally used. We also can't really use a, a directly boot a Linux kernel from Spy yet as Core Boot can, uh, as uh, x86 can, because the um, Linux kernel calling convention on ARM is kind of complicated. You need this um, blob called the device tree that is loaded next to the kernel and passed to it, which contains hardware information for the system. Um, we are thinking about maybe bringing that functionality to Coboot later, but at this point, we don't really have it yet. Um, you can however write your own payload. The payload has a bunch of functionality you can use, like the USB stack and everything works. Uh, you can do frame buffer output. Um, I think RUP should also work. I've seen that uh, Vladimir has done a bunch of work trying to uh, get that running. I don't know what the current status is, but in theory, I think Grub is able to boot an uh, ARM Linux scanner, so that's probably the best uh, way to use it outside of Chromium systems right now. You could also always chain load U-boot and uh, get the whole feature set there, although that's kind of pointless because U-boot can usually boot itself um, maybe in some great uh, future when most of the SOCs get only ported to core boot. This is a viable option. Um, let's just... So let's have a look at some of the specialties that we need for ARM64. Everything I've talked about for now was kind of generic or ARM32 specific. ARM64 brings a little more fun with it because um, ARM always had this um, security infrastructure they call Trust Zone, which allows you to put um, something they call a secure world next to your operating system, which uses its own secure memory that cannot be accessed by the uh, normal operating system kernel and so on to, to do DRM stuff and things like that. Um, usually we didn't care and just didn't use it. Unfortunately for ARM64, they kind of expanded the architecture up to a point where whenever you bring up a CPU core, you need to reinitialize um, essentially the, the stuff that tells it how the security infrastructure works. And um, in order to standardize that, ARM came up with this interface called uh, Power State Coordination Interface, PSCI, which, um, is, an, which is the standard to um, power off or power on a CPU core at one time. And since Linux decided to only use this for SMP power management from now on, we are kind of forced to support it and therefore we are forced to have runtime firmware again. So instead of writing our own, we um, eventually decided to just go with the solution that ARM already has. They call it ARM trusted firmware. And it's actually a full stack boot solution, but we only use the uh, runtime resident part of it, which is called BL31. Um, we just loaded from CBFS um, at the point after the RAM stage, before we jump to the payload, we load this PL31 part, jump there, and then it does its all, uh, its all setup on its own. So for this exception level hierarchy on the uh, left, core boot would run in this mode, but it wouldn't really care about all the other stuff. It would just um, assume the whole system is accessible. Um, then load the BL31 part, which installs itself over here in the highest exception level and then it hands off to the payload over here. So once we are in the payload, that whole secure world doesn't interest us anymore and we just pretend it doesn't exist. Um, the BL31 part can reside in either SRAM or DRAM, that's kind of platform dependent. Actually, a bunch of this, how this whole memory protection works is really platform dependent, like which parts of memory are considered secure memory or not, this uh, usually needs to be configured in some SOC specific range registers. Um, we can also pass parameters to uh, the trusted firmware, which is nice because we usually want to avoid pulling too much um, platform-specific information to the, like too many board-specific details. And, well, that was fast. I think that's about it. So, are there any questions?
Yeah. So you build the BL31 from source, or? Yes, okay. we uh, just include it as a Git submodule in Corboot and build it from source. Oh, cool. OK. So on the 3288, the rock chip, um, there's, so there are no binary blobs, or you don't, and you also don't need trust zone for? Exactly. It's an ARM32 chip. So we don't use trust zone, and there's no blobs at all. Okay. At so least for the firmware parts. Uh, I think the GPU right now still doesn't work without proprietary drivers. Also the Molly, but that's probably yeah. a Linux. So, yeah. so, so you can boot it without blobs. Yes. Okay. So how do you do your dev mode? Don't you need a simple frame buffer? Don't you need some graphics uh, so, pre-OS? Uh, I think we need a blob for the GPU. We don't uh -huh. need it for the display controller. So if we just software drive a frame buffer, we don't need it. Okay. Blobs for that. And then for Trust Zone, I saw the data sheet mentions it supports Trust Zone. Do you sort of have to cap it or disable it if you don't use it? Or um, is that an SOC specific? So when the, um, when the CPU comes up, um, um, 32 looks a little bit simpler than this, but it still has this secure, insecure, uh, secure, and non-secure split. Um, the CPU comes up in secure. We just leave it that way and go to Linux in secure mode. And then ARM32 Linux is perfectly fine of existing in secure mode. So there's you are in the highest privilege level in Linux, and there's nothing else that. Plus, you boot going. into the EL, whatever the highest EL level. You just yeah, I mean, there, there's okay. no ELs on ARM32, but you are in the highest exception and the highest privilege level in secure mode when you reach Linux. So Linux is happy and okay, yeah, makes sense. Exactly. So you don't have to sort of turn off trust zone. You just stay in the high privilege mode. No. It comes out of reset and stay it's, it's there. It's more like you essentially stay in the trust zone for the whole time. Cool. Okay, makes sense. Thanks. Also, I mean, so one one caveat you always have to think about when we say no blobs, um, there is, of course, always the blob of the masked one. So there's always some code running before you even get control. But we are pretty confident that that doesn't stay resident. So it's more part of the hardware in this case. And, and it sounds like it doesn't do memory in it. It just stages exactly. into it's SRAM. It's like a copy. Really simple. It just copies your code in, and then it should go away. So. OK, makes sense. Thanks. Hi. Um, so you mentioned that there are a bit more blobs on ARM64. Is this only trust zone, or should we also expect stuff like CPU microcodes updates? So um, there are no more blobs on ARM64 necessarily. So there is more complication. So we need we need runtime resident parts, but all these parts are open source. So the whole ARM trusted firmware thing we're using here that's all open source and uh, built straight when you run make and call boot. So um, there is blobs on some ARM systems that, as I said, all these SOCs are really different. So some of them have uh, DSPs or secondary cores that do some power management stuff. And sometimes those have blobs. But there is there do exist SOCs that don't have blobs, like the RK3288. Uh, second question. Uh, you mentioned support for Qualcomm platforms in uh, Corbett. So are the versions that um, you are actually using signing, uh, sorry, are verifying the signatures of the of boot block essentially, or should we expect those to just load anything that you install? Um, so we have those two Qualcomm chips for now. They are unfortunately really blob happy. So there's, I think, a bunch of blobs that execute before you even go into the boot block, and then another blob that somehow gets loaded in between. I don't think the boot block is signed on that system, but you do have all these blobs that may or may not be signed. I'm not sure, and are not open source. But I actually can more. say something about this. Yeah. There is a, something which is running before boot block, which comes from Qualcomm, and that thing is signed. It is limited. Like when we started, it was two megabytes in size. Uh, so, but by the end, we managed to feed it to 16. We convinced them that 16 kilobytes should be enough. So, and this thing is signed by Qualcomm, and we don't have control over that, even though we have source code. But then it starts with the boot block, which is not signed, and the rest is how Julius has described it. OK, so essentially, same situation as the Samsung uh, Chromebooks, like with Exynos? Uh, I, I don't think we have anything on Samsung before boot block. Yeah, there is a small sign component on Samsung. OK, then that's similar. Um, right, but there, there is another blob loaded in the Qualcomm's during ROM stage, I think, right, for memory in it. Is that true? Uh, 
What's that? Uh, there, there is another uh, blob in the Qualcomm that gets loaded at a later point, right? Actually, the trust zone is their own oh, implementation, right. yeah. and that one is also closed, but that happens later. But yeah, we kind of had to trust them on that. Okay. So yeah, so for the Qualcomm, I think the trust zone is not optional for the other ones it usually is. Okay, anyone else or? Okay, thanks.